no one has probably ever done a vlog from the middle of nowhere quite like this one. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me. As you may have seen at the end of the last vlog, I said I'd be coming to you next time from the middle of the Nevada desert. And that is indeed where I am. I'm along US 50, which years ago was dubbed the loneliest road in America. And that's actually the reason why I'm out here. Um, those of you who have uh, been subscribed to this uh, vlog for now, uh, any uh, uh, amount of time I may have realized that uh, this vlog isn't the only thing that'll show up under this feed. There's also my Silver State Sights series, which I do for Cola Weight News Now. And it's something that I thought of last year, and uh, it's really been the thing that I'm the most proud of as a reporter at Colo 8. Because uh, I go all around the state and I find cool places that I think people would like to check out. And I do a profile on those places. So far, I'm 10 episodes into it. This will be the 11. I'm on this trip now. I'm going to be shooting episodes 11 and 12. Episode 11 is on the loneliest road in America, US 50. And then episode 12 will be on a really cool hotel casino in Ely, Nevada, which is a very small town in the middle of nowhere that you'll see coming up here in just a bit. The Hotel Nevada. Uh, as it's called, one of the historic sites throughout the state. So that's what I'm doing now. We'll get to some cash game action, some hands I played recently that I want to discuss, and give you a look at rural Nevada like you've probably never seen before. This is the town of Austin, Nevada. You won't find a Ritz-Carlton here, to say the least. People that know Nevada or don't know Nevada think of the fact that uh, you have Reno and Las Vegas and all those bright lights, but outside of those two towns, the state is really a lot of towns like this. Inside the International Bar and Cafe in Austin, Nevada. And if you're wondering, by the way, how long this place has been around, 1863 it was first built. Hotel Nevada. It's not the MGM Grand. Uh, obviously, I'm not trying to say that. The appeal, history-wise, is why I think it's kind of cool to add to Silver State sites. So, I'm going to go do a couple of interviews with some of the guys here and uh, get that for Silver State sites. Get some video from around this place. I'm going to go check out this uh, jailhouse casino over here. See what that's all about. And uh, then I had kind of a funny idea. There was a hand I played not too long ago that might be one of the funniest I've ever been involved with. So I figure since I'm in kind of a ridiculous area of the state, I'll also tell you about a ridiculous hand while I have the chance. This place was built in 1929, so the elevators are gonna take forever. They should just have stairs that are not fire exits. Stairs you can just take whenever you want. I don't understand why more casinos don't do that.
Well, across the street from the Hotel Nevada is the Jailhouse Casino Motel with the Cell Block Steakhouse. Now, hopefully this is as close as I'll ever come to actually being in one of these cells. Ely, Nevada, right in the middle of the state along Highway 50, and that is the Hotel Nevada. At one point, by the way, it was the tallest building in Nevada. It was built back in the 1920s, and I'm including it in Silver State sites. But I had a hand that was so ridiculous that I wanted to mention it. Now, this was before I started doing the vlog. But I thought it was kind of funny. Let me do the most random hand I've ever played from one of the most random places in the state. It's important to point out that this game featured a maniac. I'd never seen this guy before, but he was raising eight out of 10 hands. <laughs> the guy was raising, right? So he was a complete maniac and he's in this game and I'm obviously expecting that. So this hand happens where we get a limp from under the gun. A guy who I'd seen before, didn't really think much of him, didn't really know much about how he plays either way. I didn't think he was a bad player, but uh, just not a guy that you know. So he limps in. I then look down at pocket aces. I'm under the gun plus one. And I'm assuming that this guy who's now around back, this maniac I speak of, is going to raise. So I over limp pocket aces. I know that's generally a bad play, but in this case, I'm kind of aware that this guy's likely going to raise. And sure enough, he does. He makes it 40. The guy who limped in under the gun calls after the others fold and now it's back over to me so now i'm going to drop the hammer but i'm not opposed to giving both of these guys in so i make it 160. the original razor this maniac calls and the under the gun limper calls so we go three ways to a flop which comes ace seven three rainbow so i flop the absolute nuts and there are no flush draws on this flop, under the gun player checks, and I check. And the next part of this hand all happens within, I'm not kidding you, three seconds of real time. I have both these guys covered, but not by a ton. I'd say that uh, we're about 700 effective in this hand. This guy around back, this maniac, ships all in. The under the gun limper immediately also says, I'm all in. I'm sitting here with the nuts. I say, I'm all in too. So we got three all ins, roughly about $700 each within three seconds on a flop in which I have the absolute nuts. Pretty good spot, right? Well, let's not start sucking each other's dicks quite yet. The guy who had raised never actually showed his hand. I turn over the aces though, given the fact that we're all in, I'm hoping these other guys will turn over their hands as well. There's one diamond on this flop, a seven three rainbow. The board comes out the nine of diamonds and the jack of diamonds. Still assuming I'm probably good despite these running diamonds. The guy that had raised clearly pretty frustrated. He sees that I have the set of aces and he throws his hand away. He would later claim to have a set of sevens, which I never believed. And then we get around to our under the gun limper who turns over, I'm not kidding you, eight three of diamonds. The Octo Crab, as the hand has now been dubbed. It's become somewhat famous around Reno as a result of this hand. Look, I'm not here to complain about bad beats. I don't wanna be that guy who's trying to tell my bad beat story. I've had a million bad beats, as I know all of you have too. And I'm not gonna tell them on this vlog, hardly ever, but you just never see a hand like that where you get all in, all in, all in within three seconds. So you're holding the nuts and you lose to the octo prep.
way back in Austin, Nevada. We've hit snow, and a lot of it. Back in Reno after a long trip, about 12 hours of driving in two days, but uh, you know, sometimes it's more fun than just a regular day of work. Anyway, I had one of a hand that happened uh, on Sunday at the Pepper Mill that I wanted to mention, and it's definitely one of those where you can do a number of different things. And that has to do with the fact that we have a straddle and early position. And this is actually by the same guy that stacked me with the Ace King of Hearts. So um, you kind of know what you might get out of him. Anyway, he straddles for 10. And it folds over to the hijack, who is a watcher of this vlog. And he goes ahead and makes it 40 over the straddle. I am on the button with two black aces. So what do I do here? If I re-raise, it virtually guarantees that the best case scenario is I am heads up with the watcher of this vlog. So not exactly what I'm looking for because obviously, I know, those of you that are watching this vlog, you can play. So I decide to just call that $40 raise and hope that this maniac who shoved $2,540 into a pot of $150 might do something similar here. Instead, he just calls the 40. Uh, so we're three ways to a flop with $120 in the pot and the flop comes out ace, nine, three with two diamonds. So I flop the stone cold nuts. It would sure be nice, by the way, to see a $2,500 bet right about now. Anyway, that doesn't come, but he does bet. He bets 60, so betting about half the pot. Then the pre-flop raiser goes ahead and raises to 215. Raise. So now I'm I'm in the same scenario. Who would have thought? Pre-flop and post-flop, both times with the nuts, both times facing a raise, and both times, I don't want one guy to fold. So I do the same thing. I just called at 215. Call. Still somewhat optimistically hoping that I might get a big bet out of the straddler, might find a check because there. as you know, he's capable of it. Instead, he lays down the hand. So disappointing to see that. Did you hear me? And now the turn comes off the queen of diamonds. So now front door diamonds come in. Hard to put the original razor on diamonds too often, given the fact that he raised before the flop, but obviously anything's possible here. The more likely scenario is what happens. And this goes back to really any flop that you see when you have pocket aces and an ace on the flop, and that's going to be your action will be killed. There's nothing that'll kill your action with pocket aces quite like an ace on the flop. He checks, and this is where I make the mistake. And I know some of you might say, oh, you made a mistake just smooth calling pre-flop and just smooth calling on the flop. I disagree with that. I think those were the right plays, but I think I definitely made a mistake on the turn. And that comes in the form of bet sizing. I go ahead and bet out 225. He thinks about it for a minute and uh, finally settles on a fold. He tells me he had ace jack. And I certainly believe him. Uh, but the mistake that I feel that I made here was simply that I bet too much. I think I should have bet really small in this case because the diamonds are a scare card and there's a good chance that he doesn't have uh, a big ace here all the time anyway. In this case he did, but you don't want to lose him in that spot. So I, I think I should have just bet a hundred or so. Maybe even smaller than that. I'm a big fan of the small bet in a lot of times, so Definitely uh, not happy with that result, um, and more importantly, not happy with my play on the turn there. Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for this vlog, and we will see you next time from sunny Los Angeles, California.